risk. It's backbreaking and it's dangerous. Some even describe the business as archaic with outdated work practices. But others say it's a necessity that allows the poor to make ends meet. Hundreds of thousands of people in Asia are hired to break down most of the world's old ships at scrapyards where worker safety is questionable. Susan Yu reports on the occupational hazards and other challenges facing today's shipping industry. They dock the world's seas, roughly 45,000 of them, and they come in all shapes and sizes. Container ships, cargo vessels, tankers, ferries, and cruise liners. 80% of goods transported in the world is done through ocean shipping. So just when do vessels reach the end of their sea life? It really depends whether or not she is useful at the end of 15 years and can make money. Every five years, I should say, a ship comes up for a special survey, and that means that she has to meet regulations, and that means that there may be costly repairs. The stakes are high in an industry where analysts say big profits are harder to come by. It's a very difficult business today because it's a very, very competitive business. So all owners are looking to buy their ships when they are cheapest and run them as cost effectively as possible. Whether she can trade profitably any further or not. If she can't, you resale or you scrap. And it's here in India where the majority of old ships are scrapped. Welcome to the world's biggest shipbreaking country. Its 100 plus shipyards break down nearly 500 ships every year. That's after the vessels have served an average of 29 years at sea. This is the Lakade Bandar district in the outskirts of Bombay. Behind me are shipyards, where shipbreaking takes place virtually 24 hours a day. Bombay and along with Alang in Gujarat are the two cities in the whole country where 70% of the world's decommissioned ships find their resting place. It's an enviable title depending on who you talk to. The Indian government recognized shipbreaking as a small-scale industry back in 1979. It's a fully-fledged business that provides tens of thousands of jobs and steel for the country's construction industry. But for environmental and labor activists, they see the industry as Dickensian, an era when the West was going through an industrial revolution and safe labor practices were virtually non-existent. The first thing you see, they've been transported to another, another century. It's, it's an operation which belongs, doesn't belong to the 20th, end of the 20th century. Belongs somewhere in the 18th century. And it's a kind of operation one would imagine one, when one has read uh, about industrial operations in, in England. It's completely manual. There is no uh, labor occupational has a safety. And it's uh, completely exploitative of labor. It seems that's an assessment that's hard to dispute, as Focus Asia found out. When we traveled to Lakhidar Bindar district, residents were reluctant to speak about the shipbreaking yards, let alone admit they existed in their neighborhood. At this particular yard, laborers, mostly young men, wore no protective clothing. They seemed oblivious to the dangers of being exposed to asbestos fibers, toxic vapors, and dust containing heavy metals, arsenic, and dioxins. They were all substances released and stripped out in the shipbreaking process. Shipbreaking inherently is a dirty industry, it's a toxic industry, and it's a hazard-prone industry, which means there's danger to the environment and danger to the workers uh, from the process of shipbreaking. And these dangers uh, arise primarily because of the nature of ships. Ships uh, that have been built in the last 30 years tend to contain a number of hazardous substances. Nityanand Jayaraman is an avid campaigner in highlighting the hazards posed in India's shipyards, where hundreds of lives are reportedly lost every year due to accidents. Uh, uh, highly hazardous substances which are stripped by hand, a high rate of explosions. Last year, he headed a fact-finding mission to the shipyards of Bombay and Alang in Gujarat state. Greenpeace International later published his findings into how substances like this blue asbestos were handled without safeguards 
dumped into the sea or resold in open markets, along with recycled fixtures from ships. Jairaman says it's a scenario that's not unique to India. More important uh, reason why ships tend to come to a India and other Asian countries is because of the economics of the trade. And when I say economics, I mean the uh, fact that uh, in places like India, Pakistan and Bangladesh, the costs of ship breaking can be externalized to the environment and to, to, and to the workers, which means you don't have to pay for worker safety, you don't have to pay for environmental protection. Hence, it becomes a lot cheaper. In the 1970s, ship breaking was a mechanized industrial operation in Britain, Spain, Mexico, Brazil and Taiwan. But that all changed a decade later. When did ship breaking become a problem in Asia? Well, ship breaking really started transfer to India to, to Asia from uh, Europe around the 70s uh, as the environmental labor standards became much more strict in the Western world. There's a transference of ship breaking yards uh, into Asia where the standards were much more lax. By the mid 90s, half of all the world's ocean going vessels were scrapped in China. Now, Vietnam and the Philippines are the latest members of the shipwrecking club in Asia, where cheap labor continues to attract business. Does the pay correlate to the division of labor as far as risk? Uh, well, the, the pay, uh, what a worker might get, there's about two to two and a half dollars a day. Uh, so that, that is uh, minuscule pay for the kind of risk the person is, uh, is undertaking. In Asia, labor laws can be plentiful. But activists say enforcing them is another matter. India does have a reasonably good body of labor law. The problem is that that's not being implemented. The shipbreakers in Alang have virtually escaped the grips of the uh, of the law enforcement agencies. And in the instances where the courts have been have tried to force them into implementing labor norms, they claim that uh, it's economically unviable to um, to give protection to labor. Howard Liu shares the frustration. He traveled to China's shipbreaking yards early last year and was equally shocked by the lack of safeguards at the workplace. China is a bit better than India. We feel that after international pressure, it's improved a little, but there are still problems in China. When you look at the shipbreaking areas outside of Shanghai, there are people still burning toxic materials and handling asbestos completely in the open, and it's a very, very dangerous situation. China's environmental officials have promised to force shipyard owners to improve safety standards. Here, a handful of workers wear protective clothing to handle asbestos-ridden insulation. But some are skeptical of these efforts, since others nearby are still fully exposed to toxic materials. I think if they knew what they were handling, they wouldn't continue to do this kind of work because the pay is low. It's several hundred RMB a month, and in the long term, it would affect their health. International treaties against the shipping of toxic waste exist, such as the Basel Convention, which prohibits developed nations from transferring toxic materials to third world or developing countries. But the convention has a loophole. It doesn't cover the actual shipping of old toxic ships themselves. And activists say brokers and buyers of decommissioned ships are keen to profit from the ship scrapping industry. They largely ignore the international treaty by turning a blind eye to dubious paperwork on the origin and makeup of a decommissioned ship made of toxic materials. It's a problem William O'Neill recognizes. He's the Secretary General of the United Nations International Maritime Organization, or IMO. O'Neill wants the shipping industry to be more aggressive, to ensure decommissioned ships are more environmentally friendly. Can you tell us why do you think that the shipping industry should take a more proactive approach as far as guaranteeing safety and the protection of the environment? I think the world has demanded more than in the past. The world today does not accept that uh, there should be any pollution from ships, for instance. Safety and pollution prevention are very closely linked. So that the world doesn't accept that today. There's been a change in attitude and uh, it's all to the good. Environmental and labor activists also want Asian governments to be more proactive. The first thing they need to do is to follow their own labor and environmental norms. If that is done, that's a big step forward. And the other important thing is to prevent 
Asian countries, be it India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, from becoming a dumping ground for toxic waste. Is Asia the dumping ground for the world's decommission ships? No. Asia is where there is a major shortage of the materials that come out of the ship's cracking process. Um, Asia, there's a major shortage of steel, um, and ship, uh, scrap ships are a major source of steel. It's like a steel bank. Do ship owners' responsibility end when they actually sell their old ship, or do they have a moral responsibility in making sure those who are breaking down the ship are doing it safely? This is a very good question. Um, the ship owner who sells a ship will be selling it under certain conditions. He, it, it would be difficult for him to accept responsibilities which would normally be taken on by the country where the scrapping is taking place. The shipping industry hopes to make the shipbreaking process safer. It plans to provide catalogs of toxic materials on board, where they're located and how they should be handled. While they do this, new and more environmentally friendly ships are putting old ships out of business. But ironically, that means more and more toxic-laden vessels will be heading to Asia's scrapyards. The annual tonnage from steel scrapping is expected to double by the year 2005. But by that time, there's still no guarantee there'll be better protection for workers. Susan Yu on the hazards of shipbreaking in Asia. And some doctors believe unprotected workers in scrapyards exposed to hazardous substances have a 25% greater chance of developing cancer.